Hey, what is up my friends? Welcome to another video. In this video, we're gonna cover more uh, in depth on the inflation deflation conversation that we uh, we kind of talked about in part one. So I guess this is technically part two. We're gonna be talking about the dollar. We're gonna be talking about all this Corona debt and really just trying to put put a feeler and put a um, put an understanding out there of what we're really up against. And we're gonna branch out from there and, and really talk about how this could lead to inflation or how it could lead to deflation, okay? So right now, and, and this is probably one of the hardest things to do is uh, track down really just how much has been printed. You see, everyone's talking about the dollar being devalued and because the dollar index is down and it's been down and hitting fairly low lows um everyone thinks that oh no it started the you know the debasing has started and um deflation has started not yet um because most of the money hasn't made its way back you know all this all these um trillions of dollars that have been printed now worldwide um they're out there they just they haven't made their way back yet where we'll start to see that is when everything opens back up and money really starts flowing again. Money is still pretty shut off and constricted at this point. So this is uh, from Bloomberg and it's sourcing from the Fed, Bank of Japan and the uh, European Central Bank, the ECB. And so you can see here, I think this is about six and a half trillion euro, we're at about seven trillion US dollar and uh, 700 trillion yen, okay? so. I don't really know how much has been, um, you know, created or, or printed. According to Bank of America, there's been about 21 trillion in policy stimulus. Okay, let's just call it policy stimulus uh, since this all started. Some people are saying 15 trillion, and I've heard as high as 23 trillion. So, <laughs> somewhere in there. But just understand that when people try and make the cheap argument that like, oh, the the dollar is going to crash because they're printing too much of it to bail out for stimulus. No because everyone else is doing it too. It would That would only reign true and that would only really matter and be such a slam dunk like people assume it is if we are the only ones doing it. And remember just how weak other currencies are uh, up against ours and remember that, uh, you know, like Japan, for example, which is always brought up and compared is, um, you know, they have negative interest rates. So we don't. Uh, what I mean by we is the US dollar. Okay, so we're gonna go back in time here for a second. This was an email that I sent out to our uh, premium members back July 16th of this year. Now it's a little dated, but just again, bear with me here. Let's start here. Um, the Fed's balance sheet, this was an older piece that Deutsche Bank um, did where they attempted to project just how much in total assets um, were gonna be resting and laying on the Fed balance sheet, the Fed in the United States. And it was about, I think what they were looking at by the end of the year is about eight, uh, eight trillion, okay? And, and this is between everything. This is between the repos and the treasury, MB, uh, MBS securities, all the facility and programs that they're running right now. Here was a look at this point in time. This was in July of the balance sheet as a percentage of the GDP, of the country's GDP. So, I mean, you can see that every single, you know, every single country on the planet essentially is dealing with this. And the ones that aren't in the the UN and they aren't considered a G country, well, they're getting bailouts from the BIS and from the IMF, who have, again, done their own stimulus packages uh, to the sum of hundreds of billions, uh, if not more, to bail out these, call them third world countries, which I really hate calling them that. And you can see that here. Fiscal bazooka 2020 is huge in developed markets. Fiscal government loans, government guarantees, you can see, and here's the big guys at the bottom, is that everyone has been printing and bailing out this year. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is according to the BIS and the BOA. Canada, Australia, these are your G countries, are obviously, uh, they call them developed markets, and these are considered your uh, emerging markets. Everybody has been. It's really weird that, by the way, it's really weird that India is considered an emerging market with one of the, the second largest population. I think they're second to China, or maybe they are first. And then China is, you know, obviously it, it bids itself as an emerging market so that it doesn't have to pay as much into the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, UN, etc. But it is everything but an emerging market. I mean, come on, that's ridiculous. But yeah, everyone's been printing. Everyone's been printing money. And you see the blue is fiscal. So some of these have just been printing a lot more money than others, whereas government loans, government guarantees, right? Germany here, um, where's the US? US is right here, see? So we've been, we've been, um, blue is fiscal, yeah. Okay, so anyways, 
that's a look at that. Now, a question that people keep asking me is because it's kind of hard to track down. You can find it on the Fed's website is just what are the facilities that Fed is offering right now? And they've got 13 running simultaneously. This is everything from repo markets to the corporate credit uh, facility to the Main Street lending program that they've got. They've got the TLF2 faculty, municipal liquidity uh, faculty, payroll protection program, that's the PPP, the commercial paper funding, primary dealer credit, money market mutual fund. I mean, yeah, they've got a lot of programs running and this was up through July. They were actually aggressively buying corporate bonds for the, the mainstream lending faculty or facility uh, up until August and then they kind of just abruptly stopped uh, at that point. But yeah, they've got a variety of programs that are running right now. All of this is creating more debt on the balance sheets. Uh, there's more money being printed. And so naturally all of this happening is gonna lead to a question of you know what's gonna happen next. This is older data, but you can see here, there's already a shift starting to happen where the gold reserves were outweighing treasuries. Uh, treasuries are still looking good. China's constantly, outside of May, China's constantly decreasing the amount of US treasuries that they're holding, you see. So there's May right there, which went up a little bit, and now they're decreasing again. This is the directly from the treasury website. The only big ones to note here is that Japan tacked on what looks like another, um, 30, maybe 30 billion. Yes, yeah, so this is in billions. So another 30 billion in treasuries. Uh, who is the other two big players? India tacked on quite a bit. <clears throat> tacked on about 10, it looks like eight or 10. And the third one was decreased by 10 Caymans. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. You can jump over to this site and check it out for yourself. But treasuries are a pretty good indicator of, of judging where things are at because it just gauges interest in terms of uh, the US and the US dollar by foreign entities, right? So overall though, that is way down in comparison to gold, which is obviously stirring the pot of this talk of uh, gold reserve this January, 2021, which I talked about in the last video and what that might represent. Okay, so that's it from July. Okay, so obviously the big question on everyone's mind is, will the trillions of dollars that have been printed end up being inflationary or deflationary? So I thought we'd take an interesting direction here and literally Deutsche Bank has done all the hard work for us. And I want to explore two pieces that Deutsche Bank has written. One, The Case for Inflation by Oliver Harvey. And two, The Case for Deflation by Robin and George here. Now, Jim Reed was one of the first ones to talk about, um, From he's from Deutsche. He talked about the 23.4 trillion that's been generated in stimulus policy here. And that was back in April. Just for the record, he believes inflation first, then deflation. But again, it just depends on who you ask. And that's why I thought it would be interesting to, we'll explore this topic more, but I thought it'd be interesting to go here and show you really like this is what the quote unquote experts are thinking and, and what they're looking at. And so this is probably the best place, especially for the average Joe to look, to really get their head around uh, what all this means and, and kind of go down these paths. They're just a couple pages each. So we're going to read through these uh, together and kind of highlight the core points. Okay. So obviously, you know, you be the judge. Let's go through this. We're going to start here. He starts off by noting that the Fed's balance sheet has expanded in less than two months from 4.29 trillion to 6.42 trillion. And that's greater than, you know, the four years uh, following the 2008 financial crisis. Okay. Suggested front end loading U.S. stimulus amounts to 9.1% of total GDP more than double that for the uh, last financial crisis. This next section here, what he covers is that unlike 2008, unlike 1929 financial crises, uh, depressions, etc., where the supply and demand issue was different. This, the, the, the demand was shook because, not because people lost confidence in monetary policy or the banks or the government's abilities, it literally was forced to shut down. And that's the argument that I take is like, look around, look at what happened with Corona is everything was forced to shut down. So there isn't actually a demand shock that took place. Okay. Which one could argue that now that uh, I believe it's somewhere between 40 to 60 businesses on Yelp that originally were shut down are not going to open back up that there might actually be some tipping point here, which uh, we'll see in the deflationary side of things. Okay. Understanding this is very important implications for the policy response to the coronavirus. Uh, most of it, it tells us that the massive stimulus is not the answer. In economic parlance, 
uh, policymakers are attempting to shift the demand curve back to where it was before the virus started at the same time as it's holding the supply curve fixed. Less technically, the government is handing out $100 bills when there is nowhere open to spend them. Okay, moving along here. Critics of the view of higher inflation like to point out two big deflationary forces, rising unemployment and an increase in precautionary savings. But unemployment doesn't have to lead to downward pressure on wages if the unemployed are simply shut out of the labor force, which, in the case of workers in sectors such as hotels, restaurants, airlines, and retail, is presently, yes, the case. For all intents and purposes, those industries do not currently exist, and there is a major question mark as to whether they will return in anything like recognizable form of months, if not years, to come. As for the rising precautionary savings, uh, household spending and saving behavior is, as every economist knows, about expectations. As soon as households perceive the price of everyday goods and services starting to rise, their rainy day funds will quickly be raided to buy them. And we've already kind of started seeing that. The second reason for the uh, coronavirus will lead to the return of inflation is political. At a very basic level, it is in government's interest to generate inflation. Um, we talk about the Fed's mandate of 2%. I mean, this is, this is conversation that's tossed around all the time. And uh, so you can expect that they will get back to that. So then he goes into World War I, World War II, and uh, what happened with Japan. But from a political standpoint, they just can't afford to go into a deflationary period at all. It would be bad for a ballot box. It would be bad for um, not only a Trump re-election, but also for a, a Biden election. And we're seeing that all over. Goldman just came out today and said that, you know, if Biden wins, it means a lower dollar. Uh, there's already all these this talk of taxes and higher capital gains tax and be very bad news for the stock market. And when it comes to the electorate, uh, there's no doubt that maximum pressure will be applied on governments to maintain, if not increase, their generous handouts. That includes lowing schemes, uh, forbearance schemes, etc., deferred tax payments, unemployment benefit increases. The political zeitgeist had already turned firmly against austerity before its current crisis hit. Now Pandora's box of government action activism has been opened. Reinhardt and uh, Rogoff have been replaced by modern monetary theory when it comes to prevailing mood, not just among political commentators, but respected economic institutions such as the IMF, who have called for fiscal activation, a fiscal activism and debt moratoria for well after the initial containment phase. The third reason to believe that inflation will be the standout macro result from the virus concerns structural forces. Here we can briefly discuss two, retreating globalization and the distributional consequences of government policy. It is now widely understood that the key factors behind the secular decline in a developed uh, inflation from the mid-1980s onward was globalization. That means going out and, you know, uh, outsourcing, right? The outsourcing era where um, China, India, uh, Africa, uh, Pakistan, you know, all, Nepal, all those areas were hired for low wages and, um, you know, sometimes low skilled. Okay, second, enhanced competition in the manufacturing sector led to a decline in costs of many consumer products. Both of these are under the threat from the virus. As the World Economic Forum discusses in a recent blog, major companies are reevaluating the commercial benefits of far-flung supply chains in light of their fragility over the last two months. This is actually a big topic of conversation. You could completely remove Trump from discussing it and talking about bringing supply chains back to America. They, had, they were already thinking about this. They were already thinking of just how big of a disaster this has been and just how much of a stagnation period this has been for their business. So political forces are at work, are also at work, excuse me, with the present U.S. administration um, pledging to end the country's reliance on pharmaceutical products from abroad. Uh, that's not just pharmaceutical products, but it's also manufacturing, it's steel, it's uh, crops, it's uh, uh, agriculture rather, it's everything, okay? Finally, immigration uh, regimes are set to uh, become significantly more restrictive, if not close altogether until a vaccine is basically rolled out, okay? Turning to distributional effects, a second round impact from both uh, retreating globalization and more expansionary fiscal policies are likely to be at least a partial reversal uh, in the recent decline of labor share of income. This should put upward pressure on inflation. The loss of labor bargaining 
Power has become one important factor behind the weak relationship between labor markets and inflation over recent years. Again, I agree. So, you know, these are some of the key factors and some of the key points on uh, why we're going to go inflation next. The rebound, just how good everyone's going to feel when things go quote unquote back to normal. And a vaccination will absolutely help that. Okay, so now let's look at the, the other side of the coin, the case for deflation, and uh, see what their you know main talking points are and main argument is. Okay, so they start off saying like, look, if everything goes back to normal tomorrow, it doesn't really mean that we're going to skip this recession. They they're claiming that it's already too late and the recession is here. So we're going to skip the hyperinflation. We're going to skip the inflation, hy possible hyperinflation. I think so, and we're going to just jump to uh, deflation and recession. It, we see a little bit of evidence of this. Uh, spending is way down. Discretionary income is down, but then again, you have a pretty high unemployment rate or jobless uh, rate. We just saw it crack the 10%, so we're sub 10%. We're at 8.4% right now. Uh, the jobless numbers are looking better and better every single week overall. I will say it was very, very fast recovery. It could have been much worse if we look at other depressionary points in time. I mean, we were looking for indication of the unemployment to keep stretching and you know keep going on and on and on. We haven't really seen that. There has been a huge returning to work. And again, it's it was more forced because we had a lockdown, we had a shutdown, and so they shut everything down. So I think this is a little bit different scenario, but I mean, they're right. Stating that the willingness isn't there, and we can already see this, that uh, movie theaters that are already starting to open up, nobody's going really. I would argue that that's because it's still not really widely understood in comparison to the flu. Everyone knows that there's a risk of getting the flu. Everyone knows that when you get in a vehicle, there's a risk of getting into an auto accident, which I think with the auto side of it, people just don't really know that it's that risky. Um, with flu, it's been around for so long, we kind of know what to expect. You know, a lot of people will go and opt to get their flu shots or they'll just increase their vitamin C, their vitamin D and, you know, immune system, things like that. But we don't really understand that yet. And that hasn't really been discussed yet with this strand of the corona. So. There is higher unemployment going into an election. You know, obviously it's it's quite high, okay? And uh, if I was on the Biden side, that would be one of the things I'd be focusing on is putting forth a plan of talking about what they, that, what they would be doing differently to bring unemployment numbers down and, uh, and bring supply chains back because obviously everyone's been affected by this, hence what we were just talking about in the inflationary side. Our willingness and ability to do so is not higher unemployment, more bankruptcies, greater fear to the unknown will scar our memories and wallets for many years to come. This I do think is true. I just don't know if it's going to be the prevailing thought or a sub thought held by maybe just factions of different demographics, right? Still, even many uh, of those arguing for inflation agree this shock is deflationary in the short run. Eventually, the argument goes a supply shock will dominate. The problem is that in the long run, as Keynes uh, famously said, we are all dead. For many households and corporates, uh, balance sheet repairs will be imperative for years to come. Corporate debt levels were high before the crisis and are now exorbitant. This is also true. There's a ton of zombie companies. Uh, let me just share with you really quick a piece. I shared this uh, last week in some emails. Number of US zombie companies nears 2000 peak. Okay, so the 2000 tech bubble. We are just about at that stage now. The EBITDA numbers are all skewed right now. And so this is very, very true. And, you know, if we look at the the reaction after the last financial crisis is it took five years for most companies. I think it was it took five years for 80% of companies to get back to normal. So that's what you can expect. That's what history tells us. So that's something to keep in mind. Government support has mostly come in the form of loans and guarantees, a perfect recipe for a severe debt overhang. Tens of millions of Western households uh, will emerge from the crisis unemployed. Once deflation takes hold, even in the short term, it can become self-perpetuating in the long run. It will uh, clobber already weak inflation expectations and create an irresistible incentive to save. Large ticket and capital expenditures will be deferred until the risk of further pandemic waves has vanished beyond doubt. With central banks unable to take rates lower, there is no penalty on hoarding cash, classic conditions for a liquidity trap. This is kind of true. We talked about you know, the new digital pieces that they're looking to roll out and go below the zero bound. If they're able to do that, that would actually stop or pull a deflation 
out if it did start to go that way because it's again in the fed's best interest central banks governments best interest to have a healthy amount of inflation okay it is it is uh, kind of baked into the capitalism model the democratic model for whatever reason as recent fed research sh has shown the main effect of pandemics over the last thousand years has been big rise in precautionary savings okay this is kind of true but what we've seen is the stock market and a record amount of Robinhood accounts being created and a record amount of options and long calls and bullishness that we see in the market right now. I would say that that is null and void at this point. Now, if the market that we're seeing pull back now, if that continues, then yes, I would say that it would snowball out of control and you would see savings go through the roof into other things too. And we would start to see a huge rise in uh, metals and defensive, okay, defensive sectors. Uh, governments have an enormous task on their hands. The fiscal numbers announced are large because the economic shock is huge. To argue that fiscal stimulus is a game changer is to put the cart before the horse. The important question is not about current stimulus, but whether huge deficits will continue deep into the future. This is true. How are you ever going to get out of it? The starting point should be uh, that a big chunk of the fiscal measures announced are loan guarantees rather than fresh new money. There is nothing stimulative about adding more debt to corporate balance sheets. Even the direct stimulus is designed to be temporary and self-calibrating. Consider the employment protection schemes in Europe, whose size is purely a function of the unemployment rate and will disappear once the employment goes back to normal. The bulk of the U.S. fiscal stimulus is also temporary. Households have received a one-off paycheck, uh, more likely to be saved rather than to be spent. Like in 2008, we, we saw some stats on that, and uh, there was record high amount of savings that has kind of diminished out, especially since the stimulus and the additional unemployment has stopped. Uh, as things st stand, the fiscal stance is set to massively con uh, contractionary next year, not expansionary. That's not necessarily true because I think they're discrediting the fact that once everything starts back up again, is uh, corporations have a much, they're much better at hiding it. When everything's flowing, a corporation and a company can actually be operating with a huge amount of debt. And, um, and everything still functions. But you got to understand is that as soon as they hit one speed bump, speed bump starts feeling like a wall. So uh, I yeah, kind of agree. I kind of disagree with that part of it. I think it has more time on its leash. They talk about China. The global financial crisis is a misnomer insofar as China came through it relatively unscathed thanks to truly massive stimulus. Yes and no. They're already on par for their worst GDP in about 60 years. Last year, 2019, we documented through different emails that I put out that there was five bank runs, a documented of five bank runs that happened in 2019. It could have been more. Again, you got to understand in other countries, you don't really get uh, to hear all the news of what happens in China, as well as there's already been two bank runs that I know of that have happened since this occurred, since this thing occurred, um, since the virus. So we saw none of that in America. So I could argue this point pretty, pretty easily, actually. Okay, they're going to say the rise in commodity prices helped support inflation expectations. Today, China is a less reliable engine for global growth. For one, its growth mix has uh, transitioned toward domestic services in the last decade. This is true. Silk Road is trying to connect them into the Middle East, into Europe, without having to rely so much on North and South America. And more importantly, there is simply too much leverage in the Chinese system to pump prime the economy at the same rate as a decade ago. Other emerging markets, meanwhile, will likely face an even greater pandemic recession than the developed world. Add the global oil price war into the mix, an environment highly deflationary. The West is truly on its own. Lastly, they wrap up with deglobalization. Uh, it is very slow. If the cycle won't help inflation, that leaves us with the trend, uh, where we have mostly sympathy with the inflation argument uh, is that the pandemic will structurally raise business costs over time. Western manufacturers will need to reconsider their supply chains. The integration of global value chains reduced manufacturing costs uh, by shifting production to locations with cheap labor, CRPs undermining global value chains, yet businesses will face pressure from shareholders, regulators, and governments to make supply chains more local and resilient to future shocks. This is all true. There's going to be a huge recalibration here going on with bringing a supply chain back to America. It takes time. Uh, the prices will be higher. Everything will be higher, at, at least at first, especially to build these new plants or take over and you know renovate these old factories and old locations. Um, in the beginning, it will cost more, but in the long run, it will be a good thing. It's just, again, 
does is this too much right now to cause this and and tip over the edge and we just continue to slide or are we pulled out of it and we're going to continue to inflate up and it's basically where they wrap up so who really wants inflation ultimately to move back to a high inflation regime we need unlimited fiscal and monetary easing uh yet we would dispute the shift in thinking on both fronts. On the mon monetary side, uh, central banks have not given up their commitment to inflation targets and their independence does not seem jeopardized. Recently, the Bank of England governor authored a piece in the Financial Times FT emphasizing the central bank's independence. There's little reason to think that the central banks could not turn around policy stance on a dime if inflation reared its head. Anyways, that's the argument for deflation, which it's a it's good argument either way. I'll leave it to you on what you want to think uh, walking away from these two pieces. Uh, we will continue to cover this in some future videos, but uh, I wanted to start out with these two and uh, I'll link these underneath the video. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you like this video and you stuck around this long, then go ahead and uh, like it, share it, subscribe to the channel if you're not already, hit the bell notification so that you get notified every time we upload, hopefully, and uh, be on the lookout. More videos dropping soon.